Hi, welcome once again on your PD education and you are watching the series of know your professor and we have done coverage of uh, academic profiling of IIT Gandhinagar. It's a great institute for you know studies and higher education, higher research. Uh, we have already published one of the video of uh, Professor Jay Chandar from mechanical engineering department. This my video is uh, related to Professor Udit Bhatia and he is from civil engineering department. Another very young, dynamic and capable professor doing truly interdisciplinary research. You know, I had detailed interaction with Professor Udit in one of his capacities as the professor in civil engineering and one another domain also in which Professor Udit is engaged, but that video I will upload later on. This my video is related to the work which Professor Udit is doing and the research work he is doing. Later on, uh, I will publish uh, the interaction with one of his students who is immediately after B.Tech joined PhD in US and he is also doing marvelous research work. So I could also visit his lab that another video you will see his lab visit and one of the very you know uh, important thing I will say about the research going on in IIT Gandhinagar is that the research work is truly interdisciplinary. The moment you enter the lab uh, of uh, Professor Udit, you will find that there are students sitting from computer science, electrical engineering, civil engineering, etc. And they are doing the research work that is an interdisciplinary research work. Let me introduce you to Professor Udit. He's, uh, uh, he's done his graduation from prestigious NIT Hamirpur uh, in Himachal Pradesh. And after that, he joined public sector uh, under Ministry of Steel and uh, he did his job there for some time and then he got opportunity to uh, pursue the integrated PhD that means MS and PhD. His MS was uh, in civil engineering domain but PhD was again that is uh, related to interdisciplinary domain. So he will explain everything uh, during the interaction what are his research areas and which domain he is working. Presently, he is uh, uh, engaged in a very, very important research in a very important domain that is critical infrastructure resilience. And he is, uh, you know, using network science, ecological dynamics, machine learning. So when we say that uh, civil engineers cannot use these terms or are not using these terms, you please listen to the entire interaction and you will realize what are the recent updates, recent uh, research. Uh, you know fields in which civil engineers can work and are working so use of machine learning in you know infrastructure resilience so uh, his research areas are as i told you are these research areas in which professor udit is working so i also asked him that uh, what are the you know domains what are the requirements uh, his prospective student should fulfill so if some student is planning to join ms or phd under his uh, guidance then what he will see in those students. So listen to that interaction in totality. Uh, recent publications of Professor Udit, uh, he is published in couple of years recently are in these domains. So extreme precipitation events, uh, climate variability, these are the domains in which Professor Udit is working nowadays. So listen to my interaction with Professor Udit, this is a long interaction but those of you who are interested to work with Professor Udit or are uh, interested to work in these areas, I am very sure they will get uh, benefited through this entire interaction followed by the lab visit, what work uh, students are doing in the lab. So you should know your professor, you should know your institutes, reputed institutes and you should know the research work going on in these labs. So let us go and interact with Professor Udit. Professor Udit, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity to sit in your office in IIT Gandhinagar and have a couple of minutes of interaction with you. Thanks a lot, Professor Udit. Okay. So, Professor Udit, uh, uh, you, uh, you are a professor in this uh, uh, IIT Gandhinagar and uh, you have joined this, I think, a couple of years back. Yeah. So, we want to know uh, your academic journey first. I, I mean, uh, your graduation, post-graduation and then how you uh, landed up in IIT Gandhinagar. So, this is my fourth day in IIT Gandhinagar. I am interacting with many professors and I am listening to a couple of anecdotes, you know, like how Professor Jayan managed to get a very good faculties like you. So, we would like to know from you how you landed up in IIT Gandhinagar and your academic background. Yeah, so uh, I did my 
bachelor's of technology in civil engineering from NIT Hamirpur okay. uh, in 2012. I was very passionate civil engineer okay. even as a student. I developed real love for the subject. Okay. Uh, thanks to the training that I got at my undergraduate institute. Yes. Uh, after that, I was having strong inclination to go for higher studies. But uh, before going directly for higher studies, I wanted to take some industrial experience. Mm -hmm. So immediately after graduation, I joined one of the public sector undertakings under the Ministry of Steel, where I worked for two years in the role of design engineer. Where I was primarily associated with design of structures. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, during my BTEC, I developed love for multiple subjects, subjects which are poles apart. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have my higher studies in a in an area where I can bring different fields together. Mm -hmm. So I that's why I signed up for a very unique program at Northeastern University in Boston, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, which goes by the name of interdisciplinary engineering, PhD in interdisciplinary engineering okay. and my course specialization during that time was water resources engineering. Okay. So I did my masters of science in water resources engineering and my PhD happens to be in uh, interdisciplinary engineering. Okay. Uh, I uh, joined Northeastern University in 2014 and I finished my PhD along with my MTech which, which was part of an integrated program okay. in 2018. Okay. Uh, and uh, immediately after graduation, I was having strong inclination to come back to India, serving one of the IITs or other top institutes in India, okay. uh, because I really felt that there is there is a need to do good science and engineering yes, in yes. in nation like ours. So I decided to come back, and the day I gave my defence, next day I was called by IIT Gandhi Nagar to okay. appear for my interview process, okay. and uh, that's uh, that's how the entire journey uh, happened. Okay, so you, you are an example of typical the reverse brain drain, I must say. <laughs> yes, so, okay. And you know, uh, you mentioned that uh, you did your integrated PhD from Northeastern University. So, does that mean uh, you, when you got admission in that university, it was, uh, you were knowing that you were going to do PhD? It was not master's, but it was PhD in which master's is integrated. Yes, so when I got an admission, it was admission in the PhD program. However, universities in, in US are very flexible mm -hmm. to uh, accommodate your, your coursework okay. uh, needs to also help you attain okay. a master's degree on the way. Okay. So all you have to do is take some extra courses that will meet their uh, master graduate program requirement and then they would give you two degrees that your program course. Okay. So uh, Professor Mutit, uh, since you are very young faculty and uh, many of my viewers on my channel are those students who aspire to be in career domains like yours. Mm -hmm. So these my next couple of questions will be related to that particular domain only. So uh, what I know is like landing up in direct PhD programs. Now I think uh, during our time it was not there but now recently it has started in many IITs including IIT Gandhinagar which is taking initiative in offering you know mm -hmm. early bird programs mm -hmm. and giving more scholarships and all. IIT Gandhinagar is far ahead in those activities. But if I talk about United States or uh, abroad countries, what I my perception is like getting into landing up into direct PhD courses is something which is difficult. Yes. Real challenging to get and especially from universities like you know Northeastern University. Yeah. So uh, this is really difficult. So please uh, uh, provide your points to how uh, to get in these particular programs for the students who aspire to be in those kind of courses. Yeah. So uh, what? Typical universities, both in India and abroad, are looking for before making an mm -hmm. offer into direct PhD program. Is that uh, is student ready to take the research challenges? Okay. So, and how they would measure that? They would see whether student had prior exposure to research mm -hmm. during their undergraduate days. Okay. So, during my undergraduate days, I was very active working with uh, professors from other IITs. Also, okay. in fact, I worked with uh, one of the professors from IIT Bombay okay. in my final. We take final year where I did very reasonable work okay. as uh, as while spending my time in his lab. Okay. Uh, then another thing, institutes will definitely look into how good is your academic record okay. uh, because ultimately they are trying to train a researcher mm -hmm. and uh, they would want to make sure that your fundamentals are in place, your concepts are good, and you understand the depth and breadth of the subjects that you take. 
that you took in your undergraduate program. So, and also third thing is that uh, whenever you apply to universities outside India, mm -hmm. and now even in India, they would typically ask you to write statement of purpose. Yes. So your statement of purpose, they have to be unique. They have to clearly convey the real passion that you have for science and engineering. Mm -hmm. And if all these things are put together, they give you a very comprehensive mm -hmm. pathway to go directly into these start early PhD programs. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what I uh, did when I applied. And yes, it remains very competitive mm -hmm. because typical admissions in PhD are associated with fellowships. Okay. Uh, so universities also want to make sure that they are investing right. their fellowships in right place right. and students would uh, be successful in their graduate program, which are usually are very demanding. Okay. Okay. Uh, so Professor Udit, uh, I, I ask, want to ask the next question, which is related to you know, aspirations of the Indian students, and that is, you mentioned you worked for some years in public sector, uh, you know, and then you left it and then you pursued your career in research. Uh, what I understand is like there is a craze in India for early getting into job. The students want to land up in jobs as early as possible. And once they are there, there is an inertia to be in that job. Now my question here is like uh, you must pursue a career of your choice. Like if you are interested in academics and research, you must go there. Right? Yes. So when at what stage did you decide that no, this is not my cup of tea, this public sector is not my cup of tea. I, I want to go into research, I want to pursue higher education. And maybe if uh, uh, I'm correct, like going from what we can say from stable environment to some somewhere which is uh, uh, unstable, you know, like from job to higher education. Mm -hmm. So that particular and that good job, when we say you know good job, like public sector and government job, which you know there's some kind of sense of stability in your mind. Mm -hmm. So from there to academics, mm -hmm. when did you decide that? How difficult that decision was for you? And you were a good student, but what about other students? who are in similar situations, they are not liking their jobs, but they still want to go for higher education, but fear that whether that will be right decision for us or not. Mm -hmm. So this couple of things. Yeah, so from day one of my job, I would say I was very clear in my mind okay. that I would keep all my options open. Okay. I am not joining this company to retire from here. Mm -hmm. okay. So if I enjoy the company, enjoy the work, which I actually was doing even on the last day, I would continue, but if I find some better option, I would not hesitate to take a risk. Because I think this is the age yes, where you must we, sh we should take a risk. Yes. And, and I had a strong passion for teaching. Okay. Even, even when I was a B.Tech student, I would organize small training camps for my colleagues, for my juniors, in fact, junior students, to train them in some programming language. Mm -hmm. uh, I was part of many student-run initiatives mm -hmm. uh, and would conduct various workshops. Mm -hmm. Uh, where I would get an opportunity to teach, uh, in, in, but I was a student that time, and that, that time I realized that I have real love for teaching. Mm -hmm. And after that, I mean, then I wanted to make sure that when I become a faculty, I do it in a right way. Okay. Uh, one choice would be is to get a next higher degree, that is, masters of technology, and and join as a faculty member somewhere. Mm -hmm. But that would have very limited research options for me. So I wanted to make sure that I complete my education before I sign up for longer commitments in this teaching and I do justice with that. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, when I joined the PhD program, there were so many unknowns that I learned mm -hmm. uh, and the, the nitty gritties of research, how to convey your ideas. Mm -hmm. And that also helped me a lot as a teacher now. Okay. It has offered a new horizon of uh, knowledge for us, in fact, knowledge discovery for us. And that keeps us very excited for teaching as well as the research. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, and, and then talking about risk, right? I mean, risk is everywhere, I would say. Even when you are in the public sector or even when you are in the private sector, mm -hmm. you have to be on top of your field. And if the, the, the nothing is stagnant, not even public sector undertakings are stagnant, as the country's need would change, their roles and responsibilities will also change. Mm -hmm. So that clarity I also gained while working for public sector. Right? This is also a very dynamic setup. I cannot just uh, wait and go along with the flow and uh, without having the, the completeness or full full hearted efforts towards my passion. And yes, I mean I was decent in, in studies, uh, but there were many friends of mine who were in the similar positions. But they were also a similar kind of clarity that what they want to do with their life. And they also did not hesitate mm -hmm. to go to their job, go for their higher studies, both in India and abroad. And all of them are doing fairly well. Mm -hmm. 
uh, irrespective of marginal differences we might have in our academic performances. Great. So you must explore at least in the initial days of your life, you should take chances, you should Absolutely. explore, so that maybe you land up in uh, some particular profession which you really love and you are suitable for. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Professor Mukit, tell me one thing like uh, you, you have been gra you have graduated from a very premium institute at IIT Manipur and then uh, presently in IIT Gandhinagar, you have a fairly good idea of the Indian education system and then you did uh, integrated PhD from uh, Northeastern University. My question is very straight. Uh, what do a student, what does a student from India learn from those universities when they go abroad from in, uh, universities, the US universities? So, how uh, the learning in Northeastern universities has helped you in enriching your you know, entire research or academic experience? So, how that particular experience is useful in your career? Yeah, so one thing that you would notice in typical US universities is the diversity and yes. inclusiveness that these universities In the form of students also. Yeah, you will have students I think from all, from all, all the countries. Yeah. So yes. all, all countries will be represented on one single urban That's campus. True. That's true. Uh, so the Northeastern University campus is an urban campus. So I think it would be one fourth of the size of IIT Gandhinagar exactly. campus as of well. mm -hmm. uh, But it would have 25,000 students so in that yeah. small urban campus. Okay. And in your class you would have Student from China, you will have students from Pakistan, you will have students from India, of course, students from US, Canada, you name the country. Yes. Uh, the kind of perspective that you develop while talking to them, while participating in discussions with them, I think they are unmatchable, I would say. So that was the, the key learning that I got. And, and another thing is that when we go for PhD program, most of our learning is self driven. We of course take courses, but most of the times we are also being trained to become independent researchers. And even at IIT Gandhinagar, our students do get good amount of training how to become an independent researcher. And also we have a lot of international students here, but uh, I mean still we have a long way to catch up as an Indian academia mm -hmm. that to have students from different nationalities in and faculty from different nationalities. And again some IITs are doing better than the others to have uh, faculty members from across the globe. Mm -hmm. But uh, in US again that is another thing that you will see is that if you are taking a course, mm -hmm. Uh, which is jointly taught by an engineering faculty and a policy faculty. Mm -hmm. So an engineering faculty would bring all the maths and equations on the table and a policy faculty would bring that what, how a policy maker would see these particular equations. Mm -hmm. So that interdisciplinarity I, I really enjoyed a lot. And that, I, that is the uniqueness of that. And that has actually helped me shape my research plan here at IIT Gandhinagar also. That's great. Okay, now, now Professor Rudit, I come to your research area, the research domains. So, I want you to tell us briefly about which research verticals you are presently working, what are the research areas in which you are presently working. So, uh, my core interest lies in the area of critical infrastructures resilience okay. and that includes understanding and strengthening robustness and recovery of lifeline infrastructure systems mm -hmm. including roadways or transportation systems, mm -hmm. railways uh, or anywhere we have a network where mm -hmm. multiple things are interacting with each other and results in a complex system as we see from a bird eye view. If you see a bird eye view of a road network you will see there are so many intersections and yes. segments. Yes. So my, my core area of research is to understand that complexity okay. and Specifically, I focus on primarily on hydro meteorological extremes, which includes events like floods or flood induced hazards like landslides, every flow, and how these hazards would interact with our network systems. Mm -hmm. Now, to solve these broad problems, I typically use tools from uh, data sciences, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mm -hmm. and I run my lab called as uh, MIR Lab, which stands for Machine Intelligence and Resilience Lab at IIT Gandhi okay. uh, During PhD, I, I authored a textbook okay. uh, on critical infrastructures, resilience, okay. engineering and policy perspective, okay. which was actually one of the first textbooks in the area of critical infrastructures, resilience. Okay. Uh, so that uh, particular ideations that I got during PhD time, uh, I uh, when I came back to India, I realized that need here is, is much more. Even we are in developing state, uh, there are so many so many pressures that we have on our infrastructure systems. Mm -hmm. So that has become the core thrust of my work. Mm -hmm. okay. So what I could understand, Professor, though you made it very simple, what I could understand, critical infrastructure and uh, uh, 
you, you are mentioning uh, in critical infrastructure about a particular domain which is transportation. Yeah. Let me ask you a question this way, like critical infrastructure includes other infrastructure also other than transportation? Yeah, so, so typically we call critical infrastructure, there are 16 identified infrastructure systems which include our, our bank, banking and financial institutions which include industry, which include farming, which include power distribution systems, mm -hmm. water distribution networks, mm -hmm. wastewater collection systems. So all in all there are 16 critical infrastructure systems that have been identified mm -hmm. and out of them we typically call four as lifelines. Mm -hmm. So lifelines would include transportation systems, power distribution systems, mm -hmm. communication systems mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and those, those systems without which our society just cannot function. Mm -hmm. and this recent COVID-19 time really taught us yes, the importance yes. of these lifelines. Yes. So, transportation system is one aspect yes. of my work, but uh, I I have sort of equal inclination to work in these four lifelines. Mm -hmm. And gradually as my lab grows, we plan to also cover other critical infrastructure systems and uh, make the clear pitch to policy makers also that why this is important to okay. pay attention to this in overall development of the nation. Okay, Professor Mutit, we as we know, you know, research should have been based or it should be purposeful research, focusing on solving some real world issues, problems. India is a huge country, it has capable people like you who can solve that. And India is a country which is also because it is socio-economically developing nation, many problems also are shared there. Uh, can you please tell us uh, briefly like what issues you are trying to resolve through your research? What are the prominent problems uh, which can be solved if uh, someone works in your domain of research. Yeah, so first thing that we see is that wherever natural disruptions happen, mm -hmm. we, there is a massive loss of life and property. That's true. And then the secondary side effects include that it really disturbs the social economic prosperity of that area. Mm -hmm. All financial activities come to standstill for multiple days. Yes. Uh, so my research exactly tries to reduce that downtime. So the mathematical algorithms that we develop, the risk profiles that we develop for multiple hazards and the recovery pathways that we try to develop through our research, they try to address these core societal issues. Of course, it's a very broad problem that I'm talking about, but the focus research elements, when put together, they would attempt to address this broader problem. Uh, and in, in Indian uh, context, I think there is very urgent need for proactive planning as well as reactive management. Proactive planning means that before disaster happens or disruption happens, we identify that these are going to be our critical zones where we should be ready. Uh, and proactive management would mean that we are practically cannot eliminate all kind of hazards. So during monsoons, even doesn't matter how better we build, we would still expect some level of flooding and inundation. If cloud burst happens, we would expect specifically in our upper Himalayan regions, yes. some damage to be there. Yes. But how our disaster management agencies should be ready, where their contingency plans should be in place, mm -hmm. so that the response time is minimal. Mm -hmm. So my research exactly yes. tries to address those particular questions. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, it's an endless problem. Mm -hmm. So we focus specifically on hydrometeorological extremes. That is, with specific focus on precipitation or rainfall reduce, hazards like flooding, landslides, mm -hmm. etc. So, so that means your research is very closely associated with the disaster management in India. Yeah, and, and beyond that, because disaster management would talk about once disaster happens, what we should do. We also talk a lot about proactive management, that right? how we minimize the losses even before disaster, is, yes. even in the anticipation of the disaster. Okay. So that is how it goes beyond just uh, talking about disaster management. That is what we call as overall umbrella of resilience. So make systems robust enough that they do not collapse mm -hmm. and if they they have to lose their functionality they do it in a graceful manner okay what we call as a graceful degradation okay. and then if they have to come back to their normalcy mm -hmm. they should bounce back in most fluidic uh, uh, way so that the downtimes are minimum. so the damage is minimum downtime is minimum absolutely okay. Okay. professor you mentioned about mir lab yes so i want to know more about that i mean what is that lab all about yeah, so when I joined the IIT Gandhinagar, again I had a lot of aspirations and dreams specifically in the area of research and putting lab together is one, one of an effort. Yes. You need students, you need resources mm -hmm. yeah. and, and more than computers and hardwares, mm -hmm. you need 
good thinkers. Mm -hmm. So I started this machine intelligence and resilience lab in uh, February of 2019, one month after I joined. Mm -hmm. And I started with BTEC students from IIT mm -hmm. So I was uh, at least six to seven BTEC students joined my lab who said that uh, we are interested in these kind of problems, mm -hmm. but we have no idea about research. Can you teach us how to do the research? Okay. So this. They started reading research papers, we were having long conversations over cup of tea, like okay this is what we need to do, this is what how your project should look like, we can start in small bits and pieces. Uh, and they came up with this interesting idea that since we work in India of resilience, we use computers, machine intelligence or artificial intelligence to solve the problems because we do a lot of data centric work. Let's call it as MIR lab or machine intelligence and resilience lab. Uh, in last two years, I've been able to get seven excellent PhD students in my lab. Mm -hmm. uh, eight master students have already graduated from my lab in last two years. Mm -hmm. I have two JRFs, one uh, postdoctoral associate just uh, mm -hmm. finished his time here and now he is faculty at another IIT. Mm -hmm. So this has been very enriching experience. And But the core focus for all of us is that how we will solve problems related to resilience in urban, non-urban settings using uh, data, complexity, and physical understanding of the processes. Perfect, perfect. So, Professor Udit, my last two questions for this introduction now, and that is related to your, uh, you know, students only. I, I, I see you are a very young faculty in IIT Gandhinagar, and within this very short duration of time, how could you manage seven PhDs, eight MIT, and that post doctorate? So, how come so many students? And when uh, I said that, I'm sure there are research areas yes. uh, in which these people are working. Yes. So, my question to you is. Like if some prospective student, and this my two questions are from prospective students of yours. Like if we want to come and work under Professor Kudir, then which area uh, we should uh, work? I mean, which research areas we are going to work? Because some, some certain things you mentioned like data science, artificial intelligence, they, these are the buzzwords nowadays. Every technocrat wants to work in these areas, whether he's a civil engineer or mechanical engineer or IT engineer, they want to work under these areas. So, if some prospective student is listening to you and he wants to work under your guidance as master students or PhD student or postdoctorate, so what areas uh, you will uh, suggest him and he will guide you? So, why we call ourselves as Machine Intelligence and Resilience Lab? Uh, but I think we look for students who are very good with their fundamentals of water resources engineering, for example. Okay. So uh, specifically those who are coming from civil engineering background, mm -hmm. I would expect them they would have fair good understanding of hydrology, hydrological processes mm -hmm. and uh, and some aspect of hydraulics also because as I mentioned I work in area of flooding. Mm -hmm. So those fundamental physics become the building block of our models. Okay. And again my lab is fairly interdisciplinary lab, uh, it is open to all disciplines and all branches. So I also take students from computer sciences. Okay. So my expectation again would be same, they should have very strong understanding of theoretical aspects of machine learning, data sciences. Uh, because when we do in research, we want to be rigorous. Mm -hmm. While we are addressing broad problems, our individual research works would be very rigorous. Mm -hmm. So that rigor typically comes from their undergraduate training. So, so that is the first order of expectation and once they come here, my second layer of expectation would be that they should be fairly open to go out of their comfort zones. Mm -hmm. For example, as you rightly said that machine learning, data sciences, they are buzzwords now. Mm -hmm. But when you look into the depth, intricacies of the subject, they, they are, uh, the complexity is second to none. Mm -hmm. So they should be open to embrace, learn that complexity, take the courses which are outside their comfort zones once they join here. And the expectation goes to a point that a computer scientist, computer science PhD student who is working in my lab should go and take courses in water resources and water resources engineering students should go to computer science discipline and take courses from there to, to develop an overall understanding. At IIT Gandhinagar we don't have any departments and so I, can, I, have, I have full freedom to work with students from any other discipline okay. and my students have full freedom to take courses across any other discipline. I really want them to use this to their benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, and such is than, uh, absolutely, rather than mm -hmm. confining themselves in, in science. Mm -hmm. So that is my core expectations from my students. Okay, uh, Professor, what uh, your profile is and what you mentioned that brings me to a very very relevant question. Let me tell you this very honestly. When students aspire to land up in some uh, higher education course in IITs or abroad, 
they have this thing in their mind that core, non-core, interdisciplinary departments, core departments, something like that. Every IIT uh, has, you know, in its uh, website, some departments, some centers, some interdisciplinary departments. You know, students fear landing up in interdisciplinary departments with, uh, because of two reasons. Reason number one, that if because it is interdisciplinary department, something like energy studies, uh, we may not be doing good in that because we do not have background of that. That is number one. Number two, where this interdisciplinary learning is going to take me in my career? Am I going to get a job? Am I nobody's baby? Or do I have some specialization? So, uh, because you have done PhD, if I'm not wrong, you mentioned that my PhD was in something interdisciplinary. So, you are the right person I should ask this question that uh, whether a student should pursue a career in that particular department which you call uh, interdisciplinary department and what are the uh, positives or negatives, if any, of this particular thing. Yeah, so I think this is very important fundamental question that you have asked uh, that uh, how we make a decision at mm -hmm. certain point. Mm -hmm. See, when we talk about interdisciplinarity, we are not talking of it at the expense of rigor. Okay. Interdisciplinarity means now you have to be good in more areas. Okay. Uh, you cannot be superficial in this and this. You have to be grounded in this as well as this. Mm -hmm. And you know how to bridge these two particular areas. Yes. So before you sign up for any interdisciplinary studies, be it energy, be it environment, be it civil engineering, computer science, computation and mathematics, you have to be mentally prepared that you are signing up for more difficult challenge than going for individual uh, maths or this and, and so on. Uh, of course, all the individual subjects also have their profound complexity. But here, the another level of challenge comes from the learning curve. As you rightly said, that we are, many of us are not trained to be an interdisciplinary engineer. So you have to climb that learning curve that may be out of your comfort zone and then, then excel into that and talking about jobs, right? So once we have good understanding that why we are signing up for this, I think then the worries or anxieties about job or future prospects become uh, lesser because you know you are making that as an informed choice that I have poor interests and there is a reason I want to sign up for it. For example, somebody signing up for energy studies, as you said. Uh, in India has a huge potential, yes. both in terms of startups, both in terms of, in, in terms of research culture, in terms of academic exploration. Mm -hmm. We are talking about uh, EVs now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the next two decades or so, we need to get our infrastructure ready for EVs. Mm -hmm. I don't really see that there is going to be scarcity of jobs mm -hmm. if somebody focuses on what it would take to reach the pinnacle. But one thing is for sure that wherever you sign up for, you go for a disciplinary studies, you go for interdisciplinary studies, you have to reach on top of whatever you are doing. And that is where your fundamental of subject could help you take to that point. So again, it's a very personal choice whether I want to become a core civil engineer or an interdisciplinary engineer. Because that really depends what really excites you. If, uh, if theoretical aspects of of let us say mechanics of materials might have excited me, and then I I might have been talking to you as as a structural engineer, but the other side dominated my level of interest. Again, very personal choice that I made. So I would say that those aspirants who are listening to me, they should make this as an informed choice yes. what they want to do rather than getting carried away mm -hmm. that what others are doing. Yes. Okay, that's great. Uh, now, Professor Udita, in India, we have different kind of colleges. We have very good colleges, we have good colleges, we have not so good colleges. Now, but this question is related to those which are not so good colleges. And when I'm saying that, my point is like, uh, you know, there's a faculty crunch. I mean, good faculties, good teachers are in good colleges for obvious reasons. And then the colleges which are trying to come out and, you know, impart the quality education, but then they have been brought their own handicaps. And they don't get very good, uh, you know, facilities because of the crunch of finance and not very good uh, faculty members, they can't get that. So, now a student who is getting educated in these kind of colleges, not so good colleges, not very good mentoring, not very good ideas, they also have the dreams to work under professors like you in their higher education. Now, my, this question is from their side. And the question is, like, how can they groom themselves? How can they prepare themselves? someday work under your guidance. Yeah, I think uh, given right now and uh, 
post-COVID world we are now uh, hopefully translating towards yes. post-COVID world yes. but uh, COVID-19 also gave us a good opportunity yes. to develop uh, remote courses yes. and, and use leverage online resources that are available at our disposal yes. to learn whatever you wish to learn. Yes. So my advice to those students who have real interest in science and engineering mm -hmm. is that use, exploit the material that is out there. Yes. If you are interested in particular subject, you would be surprised the amount of learning content that is available today online, the amount of efforts, researchers have put, community has put and with initiatives like YouTube, they don't yes. even charge you a penny and yes. you can access yes. resources across the globe. That's true. So that is the first thing I would say that ignite a real passion on you and you would see that uh, you can access courses all the way from top universities in the US, IITs, IITs have become yes. part of this big initiative called as NPTEL or develop various MOOC courses, MOOC yes. courses what we say. So totally leverage that. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that uh, try to get in touch with faculty members with whom you aspire to work in mm -hmm. form of internships. Okay. For example, IIT Gandhinagar has their flagship mm -hmm. internship program what we call as SRIT program. Okay. And I take SRIT students almost every year across from, from all over India and they spend 2-3 months in the lab mm -hmm. and uh, some of them do very good job and I really write very strong recommendation letters and, and uh, in, in fact encourage them to apply to top places including IITs in India and other universities in abroad. Mm -hmm. So they have to keep on exploring. We cannot just be stagnant and just mm -hmm. over worry that the faculty is not there or I am from tier A, tier B, tier C colleges. All these things ultimately should not define you. Mm -hmm. It's That's a true. level of skill that you should gain that during your student time yes. would help you make mm -hmm. um, cross all the barriers that yes. we have in our yes. uh, psyche. Basically. So, so very nicely said. I mean, now nowadays we don't have that handicap that if your college is located in the remote, you yes. cannot get the quality education. Absolutely. As you rightly said, that, you know, COVID gave opportunity also. And many uh, very good faculties have started their own YouTube channel, uh, including you. I think yes. you have a YouTube channel on your own name also. Yes, absolutely. So those kind of channels can be used for learning, and students can use that. Plus, collective channels like IITs have NPTEL and all. Yes. And I was seeing like uh, top universities like M M MITs MIT and all. Yeah, they have yeah, source. Yeah, yeah, yes. Open course. Yeah. yeah. So, so that is very true. I mean, uh, you're not a handicap nowadays. Yes, so that is great. Now, now my next question to you, Professor, is like you have a couple of researchers with you, PhD, MTech and all, and uh, they look forward to, you know, their mentor, which is you, for their career opportunities, and you need to take the responsibilities and you need to facilitate them to have a very good career ahead. So, as their guide, what comes to your mind uh, when you think of, okay, what career these guys are going to pursue later in their life? Hmm. No. So, that is again very important question and very difficult to answer because you know all students that I have they are very unique, very distinct in their passions, choices and their career goals. So my first objective is to train them to become an independent researcher. Doesn't matter where you want to go, first of all you should be a, a well trained independent thinker, writer, communicator and of course doer. You should know how to do your stuff very rigorously and very, very, very deeply. So that is the first baseline that I have for all my students. Then out of seven students I have, one of them is very much interested to join industry. So I would give him more of an applied projects as part of his thesis. That has direct relevance to the industry. A couple of my students they want to go for national labs for in India or, or maybe abroad, but they are interested to have full-time scientist position somewhere. So, and, and some of them have faculty aspirations. So those who are interested in faculty aspirations, I will involve them in different ways in teaching, in form of teaching assistantships, uh, um, going back and forth on various materials. I would request them to attend my classes and give me the feedback. And at the end, I would ask them to organize small boot camps in my lab mm -hmm. where they would invite BTEC students or other mm -hmm. PhD students from the lab and they will give some sort of uh, training sessions that this is what I am working on, this is a hands-on session I would give this week and so on. So for everybody, we do, my students are my mm -hmm. biggest assets yes. and I do a lot of investment in terms of time on them. Mm -hmm. So for each student, we 
for in first few months we try to identify that if you want to become this, these are the set of skills that you would need, mm-hmm. and then we work towards them. Mm-hmm. So that is how our overall working philosophy of the lab is. Great. Another thing is that they they start learning from each other. You know, once flight takes out, it goes in an autopilot mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So same thing happens now that these students they not only learn from me, they also learn from each other. They are sharpest critics of each other. Okay. For example, if somebody is making a presentation mm-hmm. and if somebody doesn't like it, mm-hmm. they would be very polite but very straightforward after their presentation. So then you should have culture of IT Gandhi never corporates to this level. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. when you open it, that would also apply to me. Mm-hmm. So if they would attend my class and I did a terrible job in teaching that day, they would mm-hmm. not hesitate to tell me because they that this class would have been better. Mm-hmm. And this is what I love about working in the that is, that is a culture of IT Gandhi we talked about. And that also explains your earlier question that how I managed to have such a large group. Yes. Because yes. it's a culture that uh, helps me stay out. It is in the auto mode now. Yes, it is it is in semi auto mode now. Oh, okay. Yes, I can say that. Okay, Professor Udit, my this question you already answered, which I'm going to ask you, but uh, since the question is very prominent, it's very important I'll say. So I'll ask you this again. When a student comes to you for interview or for working under awareness, what do you see in them? First thing that, that we see is that how good their fundamentals are. Basics. Yeah, so we do ask them fundamental questions related to their subject of interest mm-hmm. and we try to see that what level of depth that they have acquired. Okay. We just don't want somebody who has crammed the answers and just uttering it as we are asking questions. We want somebody who knows what they are talking about. Uh, and of course with realistic expectations, uh, that is you are you just finish your graduate, undergraduate degree, so we would expect you have that level of understanding. Mm-hmm. Second thing we would, I, I typically try to see is that whether there is a sustained motivation. Mm-hmm. You know, PhD or any higher education is not a cup of tea mm-hmm. for everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, there would be so many challenges, there would be so many failures, mm-hmm. more failures than successes in your PhD degree. Mm-hmm. So how resilient you are to take those failures, mm-hmm. how robustly you would handle mm-hmm. those kind of deviations from uh, from business as usual, mm-hmm. how strongly you would bounce back. Mm-hmm. And the third thing I would see is that how good of a critical thinker you are, mm-hmm. what kind of problems you have thought, why you want to even do a PhD or master master's degree, why you want you to take through such such a, a rigorous academic journey. Mm-hmm. So. From 25 to 30, Mm -hmm. that is prime time of your life. Why you want to do something which is very demanding, very grueling, Mm -hmm. emotionally challenging also. Mm -hmm. So once I am satisfied that yes, this particular person is trainable. We look for a person who is trainable, not already trained. Mm -hmm. They have enough degrees of freedom right now to go out of their comfort zone Mm -hmm. and and excel academically. And they should have ambitions. Mm -hmm. we hire somebody for, for a PhD, we really want that they have a real mm-hmm. fire in the belly mm-hmm. to, to reach on top of the field mm-hmm. and not just become an average man Joe's basically once they have. Should not come for scholarship. That okay, I'm getting yes. this so PhD is not a degree, right? Yeah. I mean, when I joined a PhD program, my advisor said that PhD is just not a degree, right? yes. it's a way of life. Yeah, okay. So that's exactly what I look into. That whether that's the best personality development course, I think. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can say leadership initiative, <laughs> I think. Yes, that's, that's right. Okay, great. Professor Mudit, now my last uh, question to you for this interaction is uh, related to entrepreneurial opportunities uh, related to your field of uh, research. So, uh, such kind of opportunities uh, do they exist? If some student wants to pursue after. Yes, absolutely. And uh, in fact, I have very strong. Uh, uh, interest towards taking some of the the products that we develop mm-hmm. in my lab towards translation. Okay. So, for example, when I was a PhD student, I uh, filed a patent and I have a US patent in my name. Okay. And idea is to uh, really fuse what I developed during PhD and what my lab is developing independently and come up with a series of products specifically targeting mm-hmm. certain financial instruments including insurance industries, reinsurance industries. Mm-hmm. Uh, and help them design a better flood management program. That is, that is my core area of interest. So, uh, and IIT Gandhinagar does provide us lot of support for incubation. So we have 
uh, fully functioning research park here. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of mentorship, how to file a patent and so on in Indian context or even international patent. Mm -hmm. And uh, even I even I give this opportunity to my students that if you really want to work on something mm -hmm. of your willingness of or your choice, you are you are free to do so. Mm -hmm. But understand risks on both sides. Mm -hmm. So when you go towards something mm -hmm. where path is a bit hazy, mm -hmm. chances of failures are also more, but the amount of learning that you will have is going to be tremendous. Mm -hmm. But these kind of opportunities do exist even in my lab and as, as I mentioned that my lab is fairly applied lab. Mm -hmm. we, we work very closely with policy makers. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example during COVID-19 some of the technologies that we developed for road networks, we applied it for city of Ahmedabad that how they should reopen after lockdown okay. and uh, public health uh, institutions, mm -hmm. they used our dashboard that we developed during that time throughout the first wave to designate the information. Mm -hmm. Now, that time we were doing it as a as a social service okay. uh, or, or a product for social good. Okay. But I clearly see that uh, there is there is a huge potential to translate things like this to, to industries. Okay, mm -hmm. Great. okay now uh, Professor Rudit, I have come to an end of our interaction, but uh, I would like to ask you a very important thing here. Uh, you know, when I visit the professors, their cabins, I find one big laptop or computer, you know. But in your case, I find three. <laughs> yeah. So, I would like to ask you, and you just told me that uh, this is the outcome of COVID challenge. Yeah. So, I want to ask you how these three computers uh, have helped you at during COVID lockdown to impart very good education to students. So, what you see as a three laptops is just a one single computer that okay. is joined with each other. Okay. And in fact, when I teach, I add two more screens here. So, okay. what it helps me is that uh, when we are teaching online, okay. uh, we really wanted to give uh, very good experience to our students. Okay. So, I would attach my tablet, what I typically use in, is an iPad, mm -hmm. where I can write as if I am writing on the whiteboard and if you would go to my YouTube channel, you will see the glimpses of that. Okay. Now, when I am explaining some very difficult concept mm -hmm. and at the same point, I want to show them some demonstration. Mm -hmm. oh, this is how this mathematics looks in a real life. Okay. Within fraction of seconds, I can switch the display from okay. my iPad to one of these screens. Mm -hmm. And now, once I am done with animation, mm -hmm. I also want to show them how I will write the piece of code, a okay. computer code or a, or a Python script okay. uh, to do it myself. Mm -hmm. Then I would immediately switch to the third screen. Okay. However, I don't want to lose what my students are doing okay. because they are at home. Oh. I don't. I want their full attention here, and I also want to be to pay my full attention to them. Mm -hmm. So one of the screen is dedicated to the display where I can see all the students in one single frame. Mm -hmm. So that is, I, this is the infrastructure that I developed uh, during uh, COVID-19 okay. so that I can seamlessly interact with students. Mm -hmm. And I must say that students loved it. Mm -hmm. it. Not even one single day. Of course, there was online fatigue and all those things, but not one single lecture we felt that we are compromising on learning because of this online. Model. So, Professor, are you also going to use the components of online learning which uh, you evolved during COVID, even after post-COVID? Yeah, so, so yeah. right now, so we have already started some of our classes in hybrid mode. Okay. So, I, I am totally leveraging the materials that I have developed and that I shared on my YouTube channel. Okay. Now, students are know the expectation that before coming to the lecture, they will watch a particular lecture mm -hmm. and when they come to the lecture we will only solve problems or have a broader discussion about that topic. Okay. So we are doing this hybrid in a sense that uh, you know, this is typically called as a flipped classroom mm -hmm. uh, where students will love everything on their own mm -hmm. and instructor would only be a doubt clearing person for them or would help them solve as many problems mm -hmm. as they can. So they would spend same amount of time before coming to the lecture and then same amount of time in the lecture where we will together do the assignments. Okay. So, so whatever content you are uploading on your channel, is that content relevant or useful uh, for your own students in Gandhi Nagar or that can be useful for other students also? I mean, there are certain content which is beyond curriculum or general content or something like that. So all the courses that I have developed, I have developed it uh, independent of 
who is studying. Who is studying. Okay. So it doesn't refer to students at IIT Gandhi Nagar mm -hmm. students. Mm -hmm. So they would cover these are 20 20 minutes video. I think okay. I have around 100 videos on okay. one particular course. Okay. Because the attention time or typical human being has mm -hmm. is 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So 20 20 minutes videos are there mm -hmm. where I will explain every concept in detail. Mm -hmm. And not only students from India. Mm -hmm. In fact, I shared it with my professors who taught me this subject <laughs> when I was in US. Okay. They are also using. Uh, these particular uh, some aspects of these particular lectures okay. because when I see my viewership details I see students all the way from Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. USA, India they are accessing those So are you interactive lectures. also professor there on your channel if somebody asks you a question through your video? Yeah so I am very responsive there also so YouTube gives this option of comments yes. uh, so as if and when as somebody asks a question mm -hmm. I try to answer them within time span of one day or, yeah. or two. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot Professor Udit. I think we have a very marathon session of interaction Thank and you. Uh, you have given a lot of information mm -hmm. and I am very sure this is going to be very helpful for the students who aspire to work under your guidance. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you.